If I were to describe my guest for today, I think that we would be here for one hour because he's indeed a man of many parts, of many achievements, of many accolades. But I would just describe him as one of the foremost senior advocates of Nigeria and also the founder of Afe Babalola University. Thank you for granting us this audience. Thank you very much for all the commendations. Sir. And for coming all the way from Lagos. Daddy, it is a pleasure Thank to you. be with you in Ekiti State, in this wonderful edifice. In fact, um, I remember when we were going around the tour and it was called Afe Babalola Town. <laughs> that is not just a university, it uh. is a town. Now what I find interesting is that we are seated here at your office. And I'm going to start that question, Daddy, because I know that next month, October, is your 94th birthday. Mm -hmm. But you are still working and coming to the office every day. So, Daddy, why are you still working at 93, almost 94? Actively working? Well, uh, I work because work is part of my life. My life is also synonymous with work. A man who does not work is an idle man. The day you stop, stop working, that day you are dead. And I don't want to die yet. In my own case, I grew up on the farm. Farming is not an easy thing because we are using cutlers and hoes. Yes. And our farm was about nine miles from the town. So we used to stay on the farm for nine months or more than... We wake up as early as 6 a.m., work till about 1 o'clock, then we would eat, and then finish at about 5 to go and look for rabbits and other animals we were going to eat that night. It was an enjoyable thing. So when eventually I, I landed in school, and my education stopped in public six, that energy, that industry, that way of working for day and night was part of me. It enabled me to study at home through probably what we call uh, distant learning from the University of London. I obtained my school certificate, Cambridge then, similar to work now, at home. The same industry, the same hard way of doing things made me to study, even after school start, that is Cambridge, from my GC ordinary, from my advanced level of subjects. When I took my advanced level subjects of London University at that time, only three Nigerians passed four advanced levels at the same city, and I was one of the three, two years Again, it enabled me, spoiled me, to study privately for my B.Sc. economics at home. And I got my B.Sc. honors within five years, all at home again. And when I took my honors papers, it was uh, in British Embassy in Lagos because I was the only candidate wow. at home again. And I uh, obtained my B.B. honors at home. But then there was no law school. So I had to save money, travel to England, worked there, did my bar within 18 months. And after that, again I worked for about one year to save money to come back home. You so, worked to save money to come back home? Exactly. I sponsored myself. Nobody would pay. So in fact, I came through cargo ship. Instead of 14 days, it took us about three, five weeks to get back to Nigeria. Let me tell you one thing about my, when I started law practice. 
Uh, at first of all, the privilege of about one and a half years with her, you one of the greatest lawyers ever. So when I left, I started my practice in the garage to the new building near Baden. I used my office. And, uh, but within a year, people saw me walking from 8 to 11 every day, the night. Hmm. 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Well, that, is, that was how people started to uh, employ me for different types of cases. They knew the man was serious one. He had so many degrees, B.S. Economics, LLB honors. At that time, they were rare degrees to come by, by anybody. Uh, because at that time, the, the British deliberately lowered the price of law, the, the qualification. All you needed was school certificates and the 18 months training for the bar in England. Okay. At that time. So you had only bar, BL, they call it. Barilla, some people call it. Whereas in England, you needed a degree, but they lowered it deliberately for Nigeria. So that was that was that changed when lawyers became the attorney. General. I said I must must have a degree. I had two degrees in BBA, so that was even uh, an honor for me, an opportunity for me. People bombarded me because they said hey, you go to that that man who has so many degrees as their lawyer. Going to your question, work is part of me. I believe it. It is important. If you, if you are determined and you work, you get what you get. And what do you get? Success. One of the things I'll ask from what you said, you said you had to save money to come, to come back home to Nigeria. You mm. were in England. Mm. We are living in a time now where people are looking for money and saving money to go out. <laughs> <laughs> and even in your days, I'm sure people wanted to go out. So why did you come back home and what would be your mm. own view on this issue of everybody thinking they are greener pastures outside of this land? When I went to England, I went with British passports because we were still under in the British yes. name. When I was in England in 1960, Nigeria became independent. And we were entitled to change our passport to Nigerian passport. All my colleagues, most all, almost all my colleagues changed theirs. They refused to change their own. But I came out of Nigerian passport. Hmm. I believe in Nigeria. And I believe that there are more opportunities in Nigeria for more to develop than trying to come into a society which is already uh, with all sorts of things. It's not easy for you to start life in England and make it. But I came back. So to me, those who are running away from Nigeria do not love this country. They do not believe in the country. They do not believe they can change this country or they can help to change this country. When I came, when I decided to to to, to retain my pa passport, Nigerian passport, it was because I believe that I can change this country. Mm. I do not believe that I'm inferior to a white man. After all, when I was taking my examination, those days, it was, it was, the, the, it was throughout the whole of British Commonwealth to extend it at that time to South Africa, to into Hong Kong, and so on. We're taking the same examination with people in Ceylon and so on. I've always believed that I can do what another person can do and do it better. Mm. I appeal to those who are leaving the country because they think it's better in that place to stay behind. Let us work together. Believe in one thing, and that is hard work doesn't kill. Have determination courage, and above all, belief in yourself. Belief is the same thing as faith. Have faith in yourself. Faith never fails. Thank you, sir. Faith never fails.
So let's go back to the beginning. You grew up on a farm, very humble beginnings. What, how have you become this person? And I know that that's a journey of years, but it, I don't know if maybe how your parents raised you, maybe they gave you a certain mindset, but what made you begin to see, at what point did you even begin to see that you could have a better future than where you were coming from? And how have you been able to build that to where we are today? First, my parents were patient from us. We were sleeping on banana leaves at night on the farm in our hut, which would change every three days. I knew what poverty was. And my hope, my wish at that time was that one day I would inherit part of my father's house and got less than part of his farm. So it was an accident that. My father met a catechist who persuaded him to send one of his children to school. And I didn't like going to school. I ran back. What a punishment. You have to wash your body every day. You have to cut your hair, cut your knees. You must not be late. Why? Why did I punish myself? My life was so easy at, on the farm. Where you cut down the whole banana or planting, which is ripe, and take only two and then leave the rest there for animals to eat. It was so easy to live on the farm. So, but my father, for the reason best known to him, going to push me back. I was doing poorly in class because my mind wasn't there mm. until I was lucky. And I was in primary Four then, no standard four. When a teacher called Olungu, a trained teacher from St. Andrews College, where they had learned what they called psychology of children, mm. found that some of us were not concentrated because our mind was elsewhere. He chose me as one of those that he knew somehow that I had the ability, but I wasn't concentrating. Now I concentrated more on this, those people who are not concentrating. And at the end of the year, instead of coming up in number 20, number 21, out of 25, I came up with a unit. That was the beginning of a change in my life. The following year, I was always between one and three. By the time we finished, I was number one in the whole school. That was how I changed. In the that, whole school? Yes, that, in the whole school. And that encouraged me to study at home through private study for all my degrees. Nine different examinations were taken by me privately. From school side to dictionary to the advanced level to, to BSc part one, BSc part two, LLB part one and so on and so forth. All at home. and say, you know what, I don't want to be poor again, and this is the path. Why law? Why economics? Why all of those things? What a pertinent question. When I finished my first degree in economics, the head of service in, in Western Region, a white man, called me at the land that I passed the BS economics at home, and I said they were going to promote me to an assistant secretary, meaning administrative officer, number one. We give me a car, we give me a house in GRA, and they will give me a police only. I said, no, sir, thank you. I want to be on my own. So what do you mean by that? I want to start to study law. Law? At home? I said, yes, sir. He shook his head. He said, but do you know, if you pass your law, and apply to us for employment, we won't employ you again because you have once resigned mm. from civil service. Say, I know, sir, I've made up my mind. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be on my own. Good luck to you. But if you change your mind, you can come back. I never went back. 
I left the civil service. I tried to teach in the city academy by the, with my degree. That I made more money. Instead of since 24 in the civil service, I was earning about 824, about 200. I was able to save money, do my studies, save part of it for my travel to England eventually. So when I finished my law, I came back again. I had many people uh, offers uh, by banks and so on to come and work. I said, no, I want to be on my own because I believe myself. The day you believe in yourself, believe, the day you believe you can do it yourself, that day you have made it. Hmm. So the beginning was rough, okay. Like I told you, I was a charge and bail lawyer to start with friends with the police for overnight cases. And virtually, I mean, this, uh, they saw where that, just so Yemadi, I understand you are Yemadi, I don't know where you are related to them. They invited me at the age of 10 years at the bar to come to the bench because of my success. And I told just so Yemadi, I'm sorry, sir. I started I'm poor, I came from a poor family. I knew what poverty is. I'm on the way to overcome poverty. And I don't want to come to the bench, only to take bribe to train my children. That's why I turned out that beautiful offer. So, to me, your success or failure is in your hands. Your two hands can't deceive you. Or oh, when you eat an angel, your hand will deceive, deceive you. You want to say that space the hand. You want to bend down and take your shoes your hand. It don't deceive you. My hand is directed by my head. And my head directs me to do what I am doing. And that's why we are here today in this university. Now ranked as number one best university in this country by the time higher rank education in US and about two two in the world. Thanks to God. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations, sir. So what would you say are three top principles? I know that one obviously is believe in yourself. Yes. And we've taken that even I have taken that personally. But three top principles or values that have kept you through life and carried you this far. One is what we have just said, which is belief in oneself. Two, you must have a vision. In other words, dream, it's not like dream. What do you want to become? What do you want to be in life? Once you have decided on that, you plan it. Plan how to get there. Then. You work tirelessly towards that day, day and night. That's why I still work here from 8 to 11 p.m. every day, except, except Christmas Day. This 8 to 11, is it still at this age, sir? Up to, yes. For me at 11, I take my telephone here. Yes, sir. Yes. We can check. And I told my teachers, just as I told my lawyers, if you are a lady lawyer, your this office is your first husband. The one at home is second husband. If you are a man, your first wife is this place. So. The other one must wait for you, you to finish with the first wife before coming home. You may find out in practice, there were times we used to sleep in the office. Parallel during election, election matters and during the census, when we were, we were briefed, my lawyers were sleeping in the office with me. You see, work. Is the answer to success. The other way is uh, stealing, and it's not a good answer to it.
there was one day in my chambers, I was working on Sunday to about about one o'clock. Four men came from Bini. They came up, they saw my clerk, they came in. When they were coming, one of them said, Did I tell you? The man was there and night. Even on Sunday. I had it. They came with the chief Chelsea case. From mm -hmm. People notice you. News will spread beyond where you are by people who know what you are doing and who pass it on to others. So, sir, let's, let's still talk about family. So, I know that for you, you've said your people that work with you, you say their first wife is the job, <laughs> their second <laughs> wife is the, is the real spouse at home. But how have you been able to do it? And I mean, you've raised successful children in their own right. So how are you so busy in the office, you know, and balance family as well? Well, that is a, I don't know what, how to say that, except to say that when you are going to have a they want your, your, you'll be warned. <laughs> if, you, if you can't work 24 hours, don't go to that place. But if, if you can, you make it. There are those who admire me. There are those who don't, 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 don't treat you to my own way hmm. of life. Hmm. That was why recently the president of King's College, University of London, and nine other professors came to visit us. I give you a couple of reports now. And their principal said, we were serving in 1829. What we have seen here within 10 years, we did not achieve it. What we have, what we have, what we have, what we have achieved in 10 years, we did not achieve it in two centuries. However, we admire your work, but we cannot do, we do not admire the way you work. <laughs> wow. Mm. So those who cannot cope with my system of work live on their own. But those who want, who can, remain with us. And they, have, and they have remained with us. Tell the viewers, tell others, the answer to poverty is hard work. Honest, honest way of achieving it. And education is power. Otherwise, how come, sitting here, in 2015, I received a letter from the University of London during their convocation that they wanted to honor me with LLD of that university. Only two Africans have been so honored. Wow. Africans. Yes. In the entire continent. Tutu and Mandela. I'm thrilled to have that on I'm the first Nigerian. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about old age and growing older. Um, what is one of the rewarding things you would say about growing older? Ah. Uh, One daughter, I forgot his name, an American, came here. He has retired in America. He stationed, stationed in Nairobi, in Kenya. As his pastime, he goes around Africa to advise universities. So he came here, he said, he wanted to advise me. I said, okay. Before you advise me, do me one favor. Go around my university first. He went around. He came back. I will give you a copy of a letter he wrote. In the Baba, use that word. You have lived the life of ages. And the world is a better place for it. So, 
have actually lived the life of ages. The age of near barbarism. The age of pretty, near pretty, primitive life. When we used to use stones and the farm to make fire. We knocked the two stones to make fire. Have I not lived the life of when we now use matches? I've lived a life when there was no less in my town. Now there's less. I lived a life of when there was no tar road in Nikiti. There's tar road. Water, there's some time, some time now you can be, get water from Bohol at least if it wasn't. That's another type of life I've lived, seen. And I've lived a life of serious teaching, commitment by teachers in elementary school in my own time. Mm. Now I know what teachers do. I live a life when Naira was stronger than dollar. Now I'm living a life of when dollar is now to Naira is one, about 1,000. I've seen much in life. Uh, every morning I ask God, how come you allow me to live for so long? Knowing fully well that I came from a very poor family. How come it happened that make me come to a city where there's equilibrium, a life of equilibrium between poverty and non poverty? And so much money that I have, and I'm able to be even uh, develop a university which is, has no equal the country. Keep on asking these questions. I believe that uh, a, my age is a gift of God, it's not my own. Because I've seen, I've gone through problems. I've gone in a vehicle which had accident, went to a, a ditch. People died there, and I came out of it with muscle. Bad road. I, on the farm, we had no war fence, and uh, the senior man had, my father was not on the farm, he had one noise, I didn't know what noise it was, he said, well, you should not go back to Adon. Ah, this night, don't, don't talk again, don't talk again. Took out some yam from the pot, gave it for me to eat. I went through the narrow path back to the town that night. When we came back the following day, we saw the footprint of tiger in our hut. Apparently that man and the grandma knew the voice of tiger. That's how we were safe from tiger that night. I have all this recorded in my autobiography of how I've gone through all sorts of things in life. My life itself is a story <laughs> to be told to younger ones. Yes. The end of it is that they can make it if I can make it. I tell my students, you can make it better than me because you have a better opportunity than me. Thank you very much, sir. What would you say is the importance of mentoring? And did you have any mentor or mentors that really impacted you in your journey in life? Mentoring is extremely important to a child. Whenever we came home in those days from the farm, I wanted to go back. It was when the moon was uh, receding. We would leave home at about 4 a.m. with the moonlight. I didn't like it because they wake us up. But again, they were teaching us how to overcome hardship. Okay. I started this university. No, let us go to my law practice. Today, I can boast with pride that I've trained over a thousand lawyers. With pride, more than five 
state and attorney, attorney general, and judges nonetheless. When I was invited twice to be a minister, I refused. I don't want to work for, like I told you, I don't want to work for anybody. When I refused the last one, the executive council asked me to choose their, anybody in my chambers to represent me, to be the attorney, and I chose one of my lawyers. It is because of the way I mentored him that he was made that he did. Mentorship is important. Right from the day you have a child, how to make sure that he sleeps well, sleeps on time, eats on time, this and that. Because part of a child. Do you know that afternoon siesta is important? I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> I learned it when I was reading privately. When we finished in the school, where I was teaching at 2 o'clock, I go and eat, and I would have a snap for about 30 minutes. Then I go to read with my lantern, maybe to 12. Midnight. Midnight. Till today, when it is time for me to eat, I will, try, I will become hungry. When I eat, I become sleepy. And I come for my normal siesta. And I be strong for the whole day. You mentor a child to dress well, you will dress well. You mentor a child to be punctual, you be punctual. You mentor a child to be respectful. You cannot call me and say your father died and we are allowed to go home because of your father. Who are you? You are a young person. That is, wait, let me understand what you're saying. <laughs> so, so, if something happens and. If a child, if the mother phones to the bachelor's law and says, the father of XX is dead, we want him to come home, we won't allow him. What are you going to do? He's dead already. Wow, wow, wow. Now, do you want to allow the child to go on the highway? Uh, can be kidnapped or die on the road? This is hardcore. Let your parents take care of the, the father. We sympathize with you. That's why we have continuous, predictable academic calendar. Wow. research that you were very instrumental to the formation of Ekiti State. In fact, one report said you almost single-handedly wrote, fought for the formation of the state and I mean Ekiti is what it is today and still growing. Why did you feel it was essential for the state to be formed? Well, first of all, the area known as Ekiti, uh, which is at most 60 feet in breadth and 60 feet in length consisting of traditional 16 of us, you see, an homogeneous society, the same language, the same tone, the same greetings, oku, orao, this and that. Oku, <laughs> eh? Uh -huh. <laughs> to match us together with Ondo, with uh, Laje, with Owo, to me, it's not good enough. We can go together, believe, work together, and make it the ideal state in the country. And many states were being created every year. So, and it was left out. I and others in the Badon led the campaign, and then there's another person in Raduki, the called first one, we led the campaign it, uh, it. Eventually, a bachelor set up a banner for panel mm. where we were to defend our claim. As a lawyer, I prepared the memo 
and uh, I was asked whether it would be Bible or not. I just told them why it could be quite Bible. For instance, I told them in the whole of West Africa, the only warm spring, hot and cold water, you could have it. That was all that Belgium has. The, we call it the spa, spa Belgium, where every summer people all over the world go to Belgium and bring a lot of money. There's no house in, in, in spa where you don't have the water from the spa, where people can, when you rent your house, they will pay for use of the therapeutic water. I told them we are we will develop that place, make it a tourist center to yield money not only for Nigeria but for Ikiti. It was never done. Again, if you look at a situation of Ikiti in the world, it's not too far from Equator, but it's not also not it's it's not, it's not near the Tropic of Kansa, which is the Sahara Desert. So it is a, that is why we have rain, preferable rain, for six months of the year, or eight months and less. That is, so we have tropical plants growing very well there. And then it, in addition to that, we are producing 52% of the cocoa in the West then. Ekiti alone. Ekiti alone. Again, I said, people are brilliant. We had the largest number of professors in it at that time, Ikiti alone. So we thought this would be able to make it a better, and they agreed. And, but beyond that, I was loyal to Abacha. And, uh, before the, the panel sat, the way of Ikiti, the Ajero of Ijero, and uh, the Obayi of Efo went through me to Abacha. He spoke to me and said, don't worry. If there is only one seed educated, you also be the one. Whereas well, number two was from Ijebu. So that one, believe that, the people believe that they were going to have it. They were supported when Israel came out for security. But my dear, Look, I've been disappointed. The successive governors have not made it possible to achieve our dream. It remains landlocked, railway logged, airport logged. And you see what I'm saying. I'm maintaining this road to, to tell myself. Hmm. And it's a federal government road, which was created over 100 years ago by the, the Royal, Royal Niger Company, which had the headquarters at Nokoja then. It didn't have Abuja at that time. It remained the same thing. Look at the Naru Bridge. So uh, when it was created, I was so happy. I founded the first uh, satellite equipment, the Taprata's and the Finance one. And, wow, uh, that's a secretariat for a kitty state. Yes, to take off. It's a new state. Unfortunately, there are not many people who are generous to give money in the kitty. There are those who have money, they all go outside the kitty to develop uh, uh, other places, put their buildings and other structures or companies in Lokonja, in, in, in Port Harcourt, Lagos, Abuja, and so on. We, the only industry we had before was uh, the days of Awolo was the uh, textile industry, which has been abandoned and uh, turned by one of the governors to ordinary shop. What would be your advice? Because you're someone who has believed and you are doing in your own way what you can do to develop not just the state, but this is also the development of the country. What would be your advice to the average young Nigerian who cannot see a future and who does not believe 
they have anything to contribute because one of the things you said in the first question was you think that there, there are opportunities in this land because it's not yet developed but people cannot see because they feel like no matter what i do so many things are going wrong how what would you say to people maybe it is what the vision that you see or what keeps you going and believing in nigeria yourself sir thank you remember i told you about an american who came here yes uh, dr scott is his name from kenya uh, it's, it's so my university and uh, said among other things that he wondered whether I was a Nigerian. If indeed you are a Nigerian, there is hope for this country. It's in that letter. Uh, I have not lost hope. The reason why we are where we are now and is because we are burdening the constitution which our forefathers gave to us. It took 10 solid years for Awolo Wars, Adano, Zikwe and others to formulate the constitution for us. We were, were living in Lancaster House in London for 10 years going up and down. That gave back to the 1960 constitution. And what is important in that is that they realize that Nigeria is a complex country, a large area of land consisting of 364 dialects. 364. Put together by the white men in Berlin in 1848 without our knowledge and then said that is long to so 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 to long to so so and that is not so that's, that's Nigeria that's how Nigeria came into being the cut off for example to the west that will be part of Yoruba is in down today the same thing coming and so on and so forth in the north part of Niger was together as Nigeria. So, and he said, with all this diversity, how can we, how can a nation emerge? And he said, the constitution, there will be a western region, another region, eastern region, and eventually middle belt and things walked away. The president was a nominal president, only concerned with matters that concerned the whole of the country together, like rail line, airline, and so on, and defense. Each was concerned with his own religion, his education, his uh, building, the, the, the comp, corporate bodies and co companies and so on, like I will have did for here and were. If, if the military had not taken over in January 1966, yes. West would have caught up with Igla today. Hmm. West would have been better than India. India was also another country, poor country, which was managed by. As a colony of uh, Britain too. Today we ordered virtually everything from India. People go to the hospitals. Um, oh God. That's why I feel bad. That's why I start, started my industrial park, which I, we are going to visit now. Yes, sir. Which to me is going to be the nucleus of industrial revolution in this country today. When you get there, you come back and tell me what to see.
the problem therefore is to immediately call a constitutional conference of where many Nigerians, people who have their own means of livelihood, mm. people who are not just coming from university and looking for employment, to revisit our constitution, possibly adopt the 1960 constitution with some, with some uh, new uh, with amendments, adopting some amendments, and we'll be back to normal. The country is today an undeclared bankrupt. Do you know what that bankruptcy means? That is somebody whose debt is so much that he can hardly live, and whose assets are owned by others. That like in Rwanda now, the loan they took is so much that the, the, the lenders have taken over the running of uh, rail line, airport and so That may be so very soon if you are not careful. So the first thing, there are three, th there are three of, of my suggestions. One, we have made a constitution. The constitution will contain a condition that before you can contest election, you must submit yourself to a body set up, local government-wise, state-wise, or federal-wise, to find out who you are, who your father was, uh, what your, your qualification, what's your health, what contribution have you made to society that qualifies to come and buy for political position where you want to rule the country. There are healthy people ruling the country. There are educated people ruling the country. There are people who have never had their own business ruling the country. And we are the only country, the, high, the, the, the only country paying the largest money for, for, for only political purposes. The number of people, ministers who have, number of assistants, Assistant to assistant and so on. You don't need all this. In the constitution, we take care of all that. In the constitution, we make sure that politics is not made a business. That politics is for service. And only those who want to serve others, like I did in the University of Lagos, where I did not take a cable. That's, that's service. The man who is. Who is Helping the country is not a it's not a master, it's not a commander. But your servant, the man who wants to serve others, like the Greek city states in the future, in the old in the olden days, they will line up and find out who is the best to serve us. If in 1960 to 65 or 6, the dictator did not answer like this. Why are you having salary now? Why are you asking for severance money? You don't look for severance money. Or even pension. There will some of my to suggest a pension when you are serving people. Look, if you, if you want to serve your, your father, your mother has done so well for you. You want to serve, help them. Do, do you collect money for from them again, from something. Look, I'm passionate about the, the, a new constitution. I'm a crusader for a new constitution, and I want to be part of it. Mm. It's the only way out. And secondly, we must pay our debt immediately, otherwise we will never, never be, never be able to make it. We are only trillions of dollars. We are the second highest debtor country in the world. How do you come about it? What was the money spent on? Who collected the money? To what about? If I were the president, president, the first thing I would do is what I Lobasio did. Go around to see the debtors. Look at what you can do to reduce the interest or pay no interest on and the, the moratorium or whatever. And then in any case, reduce the debt. Yes. Secondly, let us see investigate 
what happened to what, how we, what we did with this huge debt of several de, several billions of do, dollars. Dollars. Not naira. We are just right on a road where there is not a single good, good road, or a rail line which is not working, or aircraft, or, ship, or, or ships which are not non-existent again. Where is, where is it? Where is the money? What was it spent on? Can't we be bold enough to investigate it? There are those who can investigate, who can set a committee that can do so, but more importantly, I have educated again. But why we are doing that? Let us look at us, Nigeria as our self. If I owe money and there's and I want to pay it because if you do not pay your debt, you may be able to sleep well. Two, you can't plan for, for the future. Without money, you can't you can be planning big, bigger things. Now, the first thing to do is the constitution. And now that, should I set up a committee of uh, Nigerians? who are known to be very honest and sincere, and there are many, mm. who will ask for Nigeria to plead with Nigeria to come and donate money to pay our debt. When there was uh, uh, COVID-19, each state asked people to donate money to, to educate it. I donated 100 million here. There are people who can donate billions and billions to this country, who believe in this country, so that we can come back to normal. And our rate of and the, the exchange rate, which is almost one to one thousand, will come down to about one to one to two hundred. And I just can take off. I would urge the president to go around and beg for forgiveness and also set up this sort of committee. And they will be back to normal with the, with the new constitution. These are my suggestions. Wow, Daddy, thank you so, so, so much. This has been very inspiring, but more than that, educative and insightful. And there's, we've not touched on so many areas, but we have to end this. Thank you, sir, for according us this opportunity. We know that many people have really been impacted by this. Thank you, sir. Thank you and the crew. I'm parallelly impressed with the decisive questions. God bless you. <laughs>